Good evening, and thank you all for taking time out of your day to join us this evening. My name is Brenda Moynihan, and I'm the Director of Marketing and Outreach at the Kensington Assisted Living Residence, and I'm honored to welcome you today to this evening's webinar. Tonight's presentation is Loneliness in Seniors, Ways to Overcome Isolation and Depression in the Older Adult Population. During the presentation, we will examine depression and isolation in the senior population. We'll look at some of the causes, how to spot signs of depression, and provide tools to provide relief from both isolation and depression, especially during COVID quarantine and restrictions. Before I introduce our speakers, I'd like to briefly give you some information about the Kensington. The Kensington is an enhanced assisted living and we're located in White Plains, New York. We are committed to providing outstanding care every day with a full spectrum of clinical support, including caring for those with dementia and Alzheimer's. We encourage confidence and independence and focus on making each individual feel important. Our promise is to love and care for your family as we do our own. We're bringing this presentation to you today because we recognize that social disconnection puts seniors at greater risk of depression and anxiety, and we're here to support your caregiving efforts to mitigate the damaging effects of both. If you'd like some information about the Kensington and ways we can assist you, please feel free to contact us at 914-390-0080 or please go to our website at www.thekensingtonwhiteplains.com. I'd like to let you know there'll be a Q&A at the end of the presentation and either at the top of your screen or the bottom, uh, there's a chat box and a Q&A box. So please feel free to type in your questions there. Also, as an added bonus, all attendees will receive a post-event email containing a list of resources as well as the contact information of our speakers. Please join me in welcoming our speakers. There are, there are two clinical direct directors of psychology and they will be the presenters for this evening. And I'm going to read you their bios. The first is Dr. Carrie Heimowitz. Dr. Carrie Heimowitz is a licensed psychologist who has a specialty in working with the geriatric population. For the past 10 years, her work has included cognitive memory work designed to enhance and maintain cognitive functioning with older adults. Additionally, she offers psychotherapy and maintains a private practice in Westchester County. Our second speaker for this evening, Judy Markowitz. Judy graduated from Brandeis University and then received her doctorate in psychology from Yeshiva University. She began her career as a school psychologist, but made the rewarding career change to working with older adults. Judy has been excited by her work with memory training as she has seen her patients maintain and improve memory functioning as well as their emotional health. Judy also enjoys helping the family members cope with their loved one's dementia. Welcome Judy and Carrie, and I now turn it over to the two of you. Thank you. It's just I know you're there, Carrie. Okay, here I am. Great. <laughs> okay. Hang on, I'm gonna start to share my screen. Okay. Hello there, and welcome to loneliness and isolation in seniors as well as how to help seniors deal with the loneliness and depression. Even though this is a sad topic, the information can be upsetting because I'm gonna give you some history on all the awful things that being alone and being lonely and being depressed and some of the, the, the negative side effects of that. However, the good news is at the end, when Judy takes over, she's gonna give us 
all the things that we could do to help mitigate any of these issues. So um, here we go. The impact of COVID-19 and the social distancing measures necessary to prevent the spread of infection have been intensifying feelings of loneliness for almost everyone. In one study, the impact has been more pronounced in older adults, particularly women and particularly low-income participants. In this study, social isolation, which, def which is defined as the absence, oh, hold on a second. I'm sorry, hang on one second. I have the wrong, I'm gonna start again here, I apologize. <laughs> okay. Sure. All right. I think I'm back on here now. Okay. Social isolation is defined as an absence of meaningful social relationships. More than half of the adults, 50 and older, reported experiencing social isolation. Social isolation is defined as the objective state of having few social relationships or infrequent social content, contact. While loneliness is a subjective feeling of being isolated. Prior to the COVID outbreak, a large majority of older adults living in the community were active participants. They went to church activities. They went to senior centers volunteer, travel, and visits with family, most importantly. And for the frail older adults who still live in the community, oftentimes their only contact is with people delivering meals on wheels, visiting nurse services, and sometimes neighbors. For nursing home and assisted living residents, family visits kept them connected to the outside world through their families emotionally. Since the need to quarantine, these visits have um, been eliminated or reduced to visits through a window for everybody's safety. Uh, for family caregivers who are often older adults, like a spouse or an adult child, the social isolation is concerning as well since this population is also at risk for stress, depression, and anxiety. The president of the AARP Foundation reports that this is a public health crisis. Prolonged social isolation and loneliness is worse for health than obesity and is damaging to health as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. It's quite a statistic. An online survey over, of over 2000 adults, ages 18 and older, taken from August 21st to August 25th of this year, revealed that since the pandemic began, Adults in general have experienced mainly negative emotions. Respondents most often reported feeling frustration, sadness, anxiety, isolation, tiredness even. Among participants 50 and older, women were more likely to report that they have felt these negative feelings since the start of the coronavirus crisis. Low-income adults and high-income respondents, 50 plus, reported more stress than middle-income adults. Not really sure why, but more than seven in 10 adults said the pandemic has made it more difficult for them to connect with friends. And nearly a third reported that the longest they've gone without interacting with people outside their household was one to three months. Um, this was especially true for participants 50 and older women struggled the most. Um, <clears throat> so even before COVID, depression was a mental health crisis for many seniors. In one study conducted by Wu called Social Isolation and Loneliness Among Older Adults in the Context of COVID-19, a global challenge, because this is happening all over the world, um, he found that social isolation and loneliness are major risk factors that have been linked with poor physical and mental health status. Increased blood pressure, heart, blood pressure, heart disease, obesity, diminished immune system, depression and anxiety, and poorer cognitive functioning. 
possibly as much as a 50% increased risk of dementia symptoms and around a 30% increased risk of coronary heart disease and a risk of stroke. This is particularly worrisome. Um, I definitely noticed after the lockdown in March and my return to working in assisted living with um, seniors, the decline cognitively was startling. Um, I think the isolation was necessary, but it was very difficult, especially on them. However, the, the good news is, at least from my perspective, that I've seen that once there was a little bit more interaction, once uh, the residents got to see each other a little bit more, once I was able to go back and see them on a regular basis, I believe that, that the stimulation actually helped some of the function come back. Um, <clears throat> as with many aspects of managing life with COVID, we need to find the balance. So we have to stay apart physically, but at the same time, we have to connect in meaningful ways with our loved ones. So I'm gonna talk just a bit about depression and some of the signs and symptoms. Persistent sad or anxious mood, feelings of hopelessness, worthlessness, helplessness, or guilt. And just in terms of guilt, I just wanna sort of bring up, if you hear a loved one talking about guilt, about feeling guilty, it's likely an unwarranted guilt, whatever it is that they've put in their mind about something that they've done or haven't done that they feel guilty about it's often a flag for depression. Uh, irritability, restlessness, or trouble sitting still, sometimes fidgeting, often getting up, walking around, sitting down, changing spots. And, and this ir irritability is also oftentimes a, a form of depression that goes unnoticed. One might say, oh, he's just being grouchy today, or that's just his ornery self, or that's how she behaves most days. We want to look out for um, whether or not that's actually depression. A loss of interest in a once pleasurable activity, decreased energy or fatigue, fidgeting or talking more slowly, difficulty concentrating, remembering or making decision. So again, if, if mom used to read the newspaper from you know cover to cover and was asking for new novels on a regular basis, and now all of a sudden they can't concentrate, they can't pay attention, they can't get through the book, they're not reading the newspaper, they shut the TV off, again, another flag for depression um, that's often overlooked. Uh, difficulty sleeping, waking early, sleeping too late, these are also symptoms, eating less or more, um, unusual weight loss or weight gain, thoughts of death or suicide, that may or may not be discussed. Um, it's it's all, always part of Judy's uh, and my assessment. It will always be part of an assessment of a, you know, any kind of mental health professional. I don't know that it would necessarily be expressed, but if it is, obviously that's a 911 call. Um, aches, pains, headaches with, um, with uh, no physical cause and no relief from any treatment and frequent crying. Uh, unfortunately, it's estimated that up to 63% of seniors struggling with depression don't get the help that they need. Um, and many older adults taking multiple medications for a variety of illnesses are more likely to experience mood and behavior disorders. But the good news is that 80% of people with depression can be helped uh, through psychotherapy, medication, and or some kind of combination of the two. But a trick is getting access to the right professionals, and that's oftentimes a difficult thing to do. There's a known shortage of psychiatric professionals in the United States, and that shortage worsens as we age because less psychiatrists accept Medicare. And then if they do, what ends up happening is that they don't have time to see the, to get people into their practice. So oftentimes it's the primary care physician who will um, diagnose and prescribe medication. Um, it's better than nothing, but psychiatry would be um, my uh, choice first, if that's possible. Effective treatment for depression is ongoing 
and not everyone can even tolerate medication. Uh, sometimes it makes them too sleepy. Sometimes you get very fidgety. Um, and But therapy is always a good intervention, though often it's stigmatized, especially in the older population. And the other thing during COVID is that it is difficult because the, the uh, preferred delivery method currently is through telehealth like this. So we need to help older people get access to computers and iPads and uh, perhaps even smartphones so that they're able to try to utilize this technology, though I you know, recognize that's often a huge limitation. Um, just as an aside, there's a new treatment that's emerging that I've heard something about. Uh, it's called transcranial magnetic stimulation or TMS. Um, it's an FDA approved treatment for patients who don't respond to antidepressant medications. Uh, I, I don't know the details of it, but a magnetic pulse is delivered to areas in the brain that are less active in depressed people. It is delivered in a doctor's office. The patient's awake and apparently they can get up and leave and go about their day um, after the treatment. There are a few formal studies out there that have been conducted uh, to evaluate to evaluate, evaluate whether on, on, online interactions with social media like Facebook or FaceTime or video calls has an impact on social isolation and lonely, loneliness, but those that have been conducted do um, suggest that this is a very important intervention to help people feel connected and less lonely, less isolated. Now, in terms of thinking about other ways that perhaps um, we can engage and manage isolation, uh, Scott Kelly, an astronaut, was interviewed, and he said that one of the things he did while in space was make sure that he had a schedule. And schedules help everybody in isolation, whether you're just working and then are home alone or home caregiving, or it's a senior who's home by themselves, or not you know, having somebody interact with them on a regular basis, a schedule is really, really helpful. So it could start off with, you know, this, you know, when I get up, I, uh, I shower, I then have my breakfast, I go outside and exercise if they're able to walk and, and be independent in that way. Um, I really think getting outside every day is extremely important. It helps with um, just reconnecting with the world and seeing the, what the trees look like and hearing the birds and smelling the fresh air, even if it's for a short time, I think it really helps everything about our functioning. Um, I think so included in this schedule can also be TV, hobbies, making phone calls, perhaps talking to neighbors through, when, you know, through a window, through a door, on the phone, however it's done. And sometimes people are still going to church or synagogue. And when the weather gets warm, I do know that a lot of places have outdoor um, services. And I think that that's also extremely bene beneficial. And um, just as an end of what happens to ward off stress and sadness, adults tend to reach out to family and friends. So make sure that everybody's utilizing that. According to one report, 53% said that they turned to family, 47% to friends, and 14% said that they turned to spiritual leaders. Um, so we hope that with the vaccine, getting to as many people as possible, we'll soon be back to engaging in activities like this and being together again with all our loved ones on a regular basis. And remember that anything you do for yourself, self-care is never selfish, especially when caring for someone um, who is needy and um, in need of us to care. So now Judy will discuss some activities that can be used to engage seniors and help alleviate some of the so social isolation caused by COVID. Thank you. You, Judy. Yes. Okay, thanks, Carrie. All right, so first I'm going to speak about how to help the person that has dementia, and then I'll address the needs of the caregiver. 
So aside from the most important factors to continue practicing, such as maintaining um, set meal time, sleep, and good hygiene, I'll address uh, some additional ways to combat anxiety and sadness while working on cognitive skills. As Carrie mentioned, during the pandemic, isolation has further limited the social lives of people with, a de with dementia. And one of the dangers with that is that their cognitive skills have often declined significantly without the stimulation that they were getting through outings or adult day centers. So there are several ways to work on maintaining relationships, maintaining verbal skills, recalling positive memories and improving mood. And we've prepared a range of activities for you to consider if you're trying to engage your loved one and would like ideas on how to do that. Uh, the list will be emailed to you in a few days, so don't feel like you have to catch every word. So maintaining relationships. And although it might be really hard to get them to talk, it's so important to see if you can try to help them recall names. Um, I've been working with some people that don't even remember how many children they have. I think it's a real problem. So one way to do that is to call friends and relatives. It's important to first prepare them, maybe prime them with significant facts about the person or um, suggest talking like questions that you might ask. FaceTime helps a lot because then they're able to see them and it will help them remember who they are better. And it's also really fun for the children if they're involved. Um, email works really well because then you don't have the time pressure that older adults might feel during a conversation that it's hard to get the words out. So here they're able to say what they want to say in their own time. And it's also a great way to see pictures of loved ones, like if they're new grandchildren or great grandchildren, and then they have the excitement that could be revisited when, if they forget that they have those great grandchildren. So that's exciting. And it also could connect them with people who live far away in a different time zone that they're not able to talk on the phone with them. I once had the privilege of connecting someone whose um, son lived in India and he wasn't able to see his mom that often. So it was a great way for them to reconnect. Having a large print family tree also helps because then you could help them remember based on the associations of how they're related to the person. Looking at family pictures and photo albums is a great idea. You could even have, you could print out two pictures, two copies of one picture of a person and then play a game with them like go fish if you have the two copies or you can play concentration depending on the level of dementia. Like it might have to be face up and then they just have to find the pairs that way or you could play the traditional way face down. Now birthday letters is my favorite. Um, it's not just like, dear John, happy birthday, love mom, but think of it as like Mad Libs, where you ask them to describe the person first, and then you could fill in what they said. So like, dear John, you are, and then whatever the person said, like so special, smart, handsome. And then you could ask them what they wish for them, like for their future. I hope that your future is filled with, and then whatever they said. And if they're able to, a handwritten card is a treasure for the recipient. But if they're not, you can have them pick out a digital card on like punchbowl.com and then type in what they said and send it off. As far as the handwritten cards though, you might have to then read back what they said a couple of words at a time. So try to do that. Getting them to talk is so important. And you can do that through interviewing. You could interview them on what it was like as a child growing up or their teen years. And you could create a memoir even. There's this great website called lifebio.com that generates a ton of questions. And then you just pick and choose the ones that you like. You could add pictures. And then after you edit it, you could purchase a book through them that they publish it for you. And it makes a really nice keepsake. You could interview them on what it was like in their workplace or if they were in the armed forces. You could ask them what it was like being their gender, race, or religion during their 20s and 30s. And so often older adults are just filled with knowledge about some topic, even if it's like how to make the best chicken cutlets. Um, we've had them give lectures on these topics 
I once helped someone who lived in Brazil for 35 years give a lecture on what it was like seeing the differences between the living in Brazil versus America, like cultural differences or political differences. Someone else gave a lecture about what it was like starting a computer company in the 1970s. And um, there was someone that gave a lecture about the English royal family. Um, and my one of this one was really good. He gave a lecture about what it was like to start and run his own restaurant. And he presented that lecture to the dining staff at the Kensington. So that they really enjoyed as well. So verbal fluency is getting to say what you wanna say when you wanna say it. And that sometimes is difficult for people with dementia. So a good activity to practice that is saying words that they could think of that start with a certain letter of the alphabet or semantic reasoning is coming up with words within a certain category, like how many things that you could think of that you would buy at a supermarket or how many tools could you think of? And if you need a break and you want someone else to try talking to your loved one, you can call your local high school and see if there are any students that are in need of volunteer hours. Maybe they could talk to your older adult for a time. A lot of times people are very knowledgeable or fluent in another language. I once worked with someone who lived in France at, during her childhood and eventually she understood France, French better than English, but we were able to practice French for a while, um, use Duolingo.com, which is an app that has um, languages, a lot of different languages in a game format. So it's sort of fun. And it's amazing to me how often kids were asked to memorize lengthy poems as a child in school. We once celebrated a 4th of July celebration based on one resident's recitation of a very lengthy ballad for Americans. It's like this 10 minute long poem. And we had um, flags and special hats. It was a lot of fun, but you'd be surprised how much people could remember. Okay, recalling positive memories. This not only is good for them cognitively, but it also could change a mood, like listening to a favorite song, um, or you could even have them move to the music if they're able to. There's this great uh, video on, iPod, on um, YouTube called the iPod Project where they had in a nursing home, this gentleman who was pretty much nonverbal and they put on earphones or headphones and played his favorite music from when he was younger and he came to life. Like he just started to sing and he was remembering a lot of the words and the effects seemed to last after they took the music away from him. He was still conversant and they noticed a real difference. Listing your, their favorite places. You could ask them if they could remember different places they've been to or if they're having difficulty, you could pull up a map and suggest looking at it together. And once you have a list, you can go through TripAdvisor or Google Earth and come up with pictures of the landmarks and then get them to talk about it that way. Um, cognitively appropriate puzzles and games. There's this great game called Shake Loose a Memory where it's a card game, you just pick up a card and um, it could be topics like questions that ask you, have you ever held a newborn baby? or have you ever won at poker? Anything to get them talking. And that could be something that you could also do through Zoom so that other relatives or friends could hear their answers or they could also answer some questions. A lot of times the memories, um, the attention span of older adults might be limited for a whole movie, but watching movie clips on uh, YouTube might be a good idea. It helps them remember a happier time. Singing or reciting their favorite prayers recalls a comforting experience or resets a mood. You could even have them hold rosary beads. Um, the Lord's Prayer is a common one or Psalm 23. They seem to know those two by heart a lot of times. Now activities that you might like to try to change a mood often involve using the senses. So taste. I mean, chocolate chip cookies are just delicious, but besides that, you can get them to help by 
um, pouring, mixing, um, anything to get them involved. And if they, let's say, have a, a recipe that they like and they remember any of it, just write it down, make the meal together, and then take a picture of it, take a picture of the card with the recipe on it, and then you could send it to Shutterfly and get a cookbook out of it after you have a bunch of these. Just an idea. Um, smell, having a spa day with scented candles, room spray, lotion, you could give hand massages or um, a manicure, anything to help them feel special. Sound, you can listen to guided imagery together. There are apps like Calm or Balance that have guided imagery, or you can find it on YouTube. And also sharing short appropriate jokes or short stories that are funny. Um, you can find them through Reader's Digest or there's a lot on the internet now. That could definitely change the mood. So as far as touch and movement, this first picture of a woman with a baby doll, it might seem odd, but baby dolls sometimes are very therapeutic for some people. They feel like they're back in that caregiving mode. They like to dress them or feed them like a pretend bottle. It's enjoyable to them. Similarly, there's also these mechanical pets or stuffed animals that are interactive. Um, I once had the pleasure of working with this woman who loved birds. I gave her a parrot that then repeated everything she said it was one of these stuffed animals and it made her smile and it made her talk a lot. So it was very effective. Um, seated exercise, Carrie mentioned how important exercise is. You can do um, through YouTube, they have chair yoga or seated exercise for seniors actually, they have them specifically. And although paint and Play-Doh or clay could be messy, it might be a good avenue for your older adult to express themselves in a different way. So it might be worth it. And sight, seeing something green growing just feels good. Um, something a lot of people have been doing during the pandemic is taking store-bought um, scallions and then chopping off the tops. Your eye have mine that I've been doing. And then you just put in a little bit of water, not as much as that, because that could get it soggy. And then once the roots are established, you could then plant it in soil. And then um, you just keep on cutting off the green and eating them. And you could do that with garlic as well. If you've had it in the refrigerator too long and it starts to sprout, that's the perfect time. You just pop it in some soil and you eat just the tops, the garlic greens. They're very mild and yummy. And sitting by a window, getting sun, like Carrie was mentioning how important it is to go outside. If they're not able to go outside, just sitting by a sunny window is also a good idea. It helps with sleep regulation to be exposed to bright light during the day. And for the caregiver. So dealing with the isolation, um, there are websites that like Connect to Effect has a ton of resources. There are so many different options on there like um, volunteer options to connect with others. They have um, support groups on there. They also have an online ass isolation assessment just to see if you really are feeling isolated. Um, they could also set you up with people to call every, or I don't know how often, but they have volunteers who will call like through Mon Ami. That's another website that will call. Um, if you have time to volunteer though, then there's volunteernewyork.org. Connect to Effect also has some volunteer options and they're all virtual. Well, you pick the ones that you want and they have virtual ones. Like, um, let's see, like making art for people that are in um, nursing homes. Um, and then meetup.com, that is a website that has so many different clubs or ways to connect with other people like book clubs and virtual coffee groups and support groups for people that are dealing with stress and anxiety. But they also have things like um, hikes that are you know, places that you did like to go to, like people that you can talk to that did the same things. And then for your fun and cognitive stimulation, you can play brain games on AARP. Eventbrite is a website that has a ton of different programs 
like um, they have comedians, they could have classes or classes based on art or music. And um, you could also see your local library or community center to see what they have if their websites are running and showing you different programs on there. And lastly, if you're having a hard time coping in any way, there are people who can help. You can reach out 24 seven to a hotline such as the crisis text line, or you can get support through a therapist. Telehealth is now, um, Medicare is covering therapy through telehealth or through phone calls. But please remember that even though you are physically isolating to protect yourself and your loved one, you are never alone. Thank you. Now Brenda is going to take over as soon as I stop share. Okay. So Brenda will pop on and ask our, some questions that people have shared. Oh, there you are. Thank you. Thanks, ladies. Okay. So we do have some questions. Folks, I encourage you either at the top of your Zoom screen or the bottom. Um, there's a little area that says Q&A. And there's also a chat. So please feel free to type in your questions there. I have a question in reference to, um, Carrie, the magnetic treatment you were talking about. Can someone use this if they have a pacemaker? I really don't know, but I certainly would be happy to try to get you the information. There, it, there was a local person here in Westchester that was doing this. That's how I knew it. It was up in my office. I believe it was a psychiatry a um, uh, person, a psychiatrist's office. So I will definitely uh, get you the information, Brenda, so that when you send the information out, um, you can include that. Perfect. I uh, just want to mention one of our attendees had said, please feel free to go to DeRote USA. Um, they actually have a myriad of programs. And I wanted to add the Kensington actually has on our website, www.thekensingtonwhiteplains.com, something called Connect. We've got a lot of different things, activities, music. Um, feel free to peruse. Uh, you can have your loved one also watch. We also have um, twice a month on a Wednesday in the afternoon, live Tai Chi. Again, whether you're a caregiver or for your loved one, it's great exercise. Carrie, you were mentioning the exercise, so feel free. Okay, another question. At what point do I contact a healthcare professional like a therapist like yourselves if my mom is depressed? I, I kind of feel that you should do it as soon as you kind of recognize that they're depressed. Judy had mentioned there, there's psychology today uh, that, that's available. There's a, you know, a very big resource there where you could be connected with someone who accepts your insurance and is taking new patients. So I don't think that you should wait. I think that therapy is important and I think it's so helpful. And if we could get seniors over the stigma of it and see it as self-care, uh, I, I think that you shouldn't wait. Okay. Another question, does yoga and meditation help to reduce depression? Go ahead, Judy. Um, well, it's helpful to, I mean, first it gives you a break from the depression by focusing on yoga and meditation, did you say? Yoga and, yes. med yeah, yoga so, and meditation. Yeah, the idea is that you're gonna just push those thoughts aside for a while while you're focusing just on the meditating. So that you, if the, it's like a muscle, the more you get to do that, the more you could just push those sad thoughts away and just focus on something else. Okay. Another question. Is it normal to be depressed because of COVID going on for so long? Yes, I think. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, I mean, I don't know about depressed, but very sad. I mean, we are all suffering a loss here. And to not acknowledge that is, it's just silly because this is hard for everyone. And you know, does COVID cause depression? I, no, it's not, that's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that it's definitely a factor for everyone. And if they're limited in, in their interaction, it could cause more sadness. So I, I mean, think with people that are not in limited interaction, I have to say that in my private practice, 
with young people, people in their late 20s, early 30s that are very engaged in the world in terms of going to work, mostly virtual. They're worried. They're worried about being out and, and interacting and, and, and um, getting COVID and bringing it to their parents and their grandparents in some cases. So they do stay home. They do isolate. They don't see nieces and nephews. And it's almost a year. It's coming up on a year. I think everybody is right. really struggling. Uh, I, I think it's a it's a state. It's a temporary um, experience for most of us, and I think it will pass. Uh, but for older people, I think that there's, you know, a lot of chemistry involved in this, and a big reset that's going to need to happen. So as much as we could do now to engage people, keep them active, I think we should. We have time for one more question, and I, I, I think I know the answer to this too. It's okay to feel funky because of COVID? I think they're yeah. referring to the isolation and everything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? I, I agree with you. I think it's a worldwide effect that everyone's feeling. I think, but as you said, when you get to a certain point, there are things that you can do, as Judy mentioned, or uh, professionals you can turn, turn to, including yourselves. So ladies, I want to thank you so much. Uh, it was a wonderful presentation, really great information. And folks, please remember, um, you will get an email with the information, most of the information that you heard tonight. And I'd also like to thank my colleague, Christiane Lee. She's actually on the back end. I want to thank her for her assistance in this presentation. And again, if you'd like to learn more about the Kensington, please feel free to go to our website. Remember, we've got wonderful activities you can watch www.thekensingtonwhiteplains.com or call us at 914-390-0080. Have a great night, everybody. Take care. Thank you.